Hello and welcome to Bridging Voices, the video podcast series by the Kanran Adenauer Foundation in Brussels. My name is Rares Giorgiano and I am a research assistant at the Düsseldorf Party Research Institute at the Heinrich Heine University in Germany. And I am glad to be joined today by two very good uh, experts. I am joined by Consulata Rafael Selly of Tanzania and by Siripan Noxan Savadei of Thailand. Consulata, Siripan, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. having us. Consulata, you are a lecturer at in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. You are an experienced researcher and have led and taken part in several consulting projects for different uh, organizations like the United Nations uh, Women Department. And Sripan, you are an associate professor in the Department of Government at the um, Chulongkorn University in Thailand. And you are an excellent expert on electoral systems political behavior, Thai politics, and institutional design. And your research about voting behavior in Thailand won an award from the National Research Council of Thailand. So congratulations for that. Thank you. Both of you uh, worked at the study that you presented this morning, which is called Strengthening Legal Frameworks for Political Parties, which was developed by uh, the Düsseldorf Party uh, Research Institute in cooperation with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, the office here in Brussels. This study offers an in-depth perspective on multiple issues in the countries that we analyze, including uh, party law, electoral law, and parliamentary law. And uh, we are here today to talk about the developmental, the democratic development in your countries, in Tanzania and in Thailand, respectively. Uh, this podcast is also a series of a dialogue program by the Multinational Dialogue Program of the Kotran Adenauer Office here in Brussels. And it serves as a platform to exchange views of the findings of the studies. So let's um, just dive into our uh, conversation today. And I would like to ask you to, to describe the state of democracy in, in your, your countries. Consulat, how, how would you say that uh, is the state of democracy in Tanzania? Um, thank you very much. Um, I would say um, in order to um, measure the state of democracy in our country, we need to go back a little bit into the historical and, and political development of the country. Um, so Tanzania is a union of two former independent states of Tanganyika and Zanzibar, and these two united in 1964 to um, form what we now call the United Republic of Tanzania. But um, the country uh, was under the British colonial system before it got independence. Um, And by the time the British left the country, they um, instituted a a constitution that was spirited in a multi-party form of parliamentary democracy where the parliament was seen as a, a supreme um, organ. But then that did not last long. Um, we changed that system to a republican system in 1962, giving immense uh, and excessive powers to the president. But uh, we did not stop that. In 1977, we um, um, uh, put in place a one party system with uh, the enactment of what we call a permanent constitution of the United Republic of Tanzania. Um, and since then, this constitution is in, uh, is in, is in, is in place. Um, so in 1992, we uh, restored multi-party politics, of course, with um, forces, uh, both external and internal forces. Um, and we made really not substantial changes to the 1977 constitution, which was spirited towards one party system. Uh, what we did was just to say that now Tanzania is um, a multi-party system, but a lot of other provisions remained in favor of the one-party system. So now I would say the state of democracy in Tanzania is um, uh, not um, quite strong. And in fact, um, a lot of experts um, have characterized uh, Tanzania as an electoral democracy or a hybrid regime where elections are held um, 
in different um, uh, periodically, but they, uh, these elections do not meet uh, minimal standards of democracy, of freeness, fairness, and competitiveness. Um, I thank you, Consulato, for this uh, introductory statement, and I would like to address the same question to you, Sirip, and how would you describe the state of democracy in Thailand? Okay, let me mention the 1997 constitution. Um, it was drafted in order to reduce the military presence in Thai politics. You know Thailand has um, experienced a lot of coup d'etats, and every time that coup d'etats happened, um, they draft the new constitutions. So, so far, Thailand has 20 constitutions, maybe one of the country with most constitutions in the world. Back in 1997 constitutions, uh, we have witnessed um, a strong party government. Uh, some people called it a dominant party, one dominant party uh, under the name of Thai Rak Thai. But then again, in 2006, there was a coup d'etat overthrew the 1997 constitution, draft a new one. And um, the second coup d'etat within these 20 years happened in 2014. And this time, the military took a longer period to install the constitution, which is the current one, 2017 constitution, and allow uh, the election uh, in 2019, but that election, I would not call it um, a way to pave uh, the parts to democracy, because um, I would rather think of that election as a way to legitimize military control over the politics or a hybrid regime, or we call it a competitive authoritarianism. Um, the military could finish their terms in March 24 this year. And um, we are looking for the next election, which will be held this year, maybe in late April or um, early of May. But uh, the prospect for democratization in Thailand has not been very bright. Um, there's uncertain that we will have a peaceful transfer of power after the next election. Um, maybe that another dissolution of uh, the parties or another violence might happen. But then we talk about that later. Thank you. Uh, what, what I was asking myself is you've had in Thailand a lot of coup d'etats. Um, sort of every couple of years there has been a coup d'etat. Right. And I remember you describing this morning when, um, during your statement, uh, during your presentation, that and up until 2014, before the coup d'etat in 2014, right. the electoral process was uh, pretty transparent. So what I was asking myself is, what is the, um, the effect that the coup d'etat has on the democratization process? Um, is it like the coup d'etats, the military intervenes to stop democratization mm -hmm. or how would you see this well every time there's a coup d'etat the first thing that they do is to to overthrow the constitutions so that leads to the discontinuities of electoral system and political parties and uh, the 2014 coup d'etat in particular the military regime used every effort to tilt the playing field in favor of um, the Chuntao Party, which was created uh, just four months before the elections. So they had installed the electoral system that uh, allow 11 single parties to join the government, allow a parties, uh, which I call state sponsor party for the first time in Thailand, without um, winning the seats in the parliament to become a core party government. Um, so this has resulted in um, the lost faith of the people. Um, and I think for the two coup d'etats in the past 20 years, one thing for me is uh, people of Thailand have learned that coup d'etat is not um, a good mean to resolve conflicts. 
and they become uh, kind of fed of coup d'etats in the future. But still, there's no guarantee that Thailand won't have uh, another coup d'etat in the near future. And you said that newly also uh, state-sponsored parties were allowed to run. What do you mean by state-sponsored party? Um, the sponsor party means that the party that is favored by the state itself. Um, like and do, do, they, do they also get money from the state or are controlled directly by the state? Um, not controlled directly by the state, but um, they get some favors uh, from uh, state apparatus. For example, independent organizations, um, the judgment from the constitutional court would favor them. Um, the rules and regulations applied by the election commission would uh, give them some advantages uh, in the playing field. So I would call this state sponsor party, which did not happen uh, before the 2014 coup d'etat. We had a 2006 coup d'etat before, the one that toppled Thai Rak Thai and Thaksin Chinawat. Uh, but back then, the military did not organize its own party. So for me, I think the, um, the military have learned from, from their past experiences and they learned that if they want to stay longer in power to maintain the power, they have to go through election uh, by establishing its own parties. And right now we have two junta proxy militaries competing against each other uh, during the next election, but I mean, after the election, they might again uh, join force and form a coalition government. And could you maybe tell us what the proportion between state sponsored parties and organic parties is in Thailand? Do, what, what do you mean, portion? The, the proportion. So. Uh, the pro proportion. Well, there's actually there's only one state sponsored party, which is Palang Pacharat. I mean, the state sponsor parties, um, the leaders of the parties is um, the f uh, retired general, and they co-opted some uh, politicians from um, other parties. They used state apparatus um, to, uh, to take advantage during the election. Um, they used the government budget during the campaign like that. Uh, this one state sponsor party form a government with other parties. Um, the proportion between a coalition government and the opposition is uh, from the beginning, the opposition received um, 246 seats in the lower house. Um, there were four parties from the beginning, five parties from the beginning. There were five parties from the beginning, and afterward, one party uh, defected the opposition camp to join force with uh, the coalition government. Uh, the government itself, um, composed of 19 political parties, 11 single seat parties, and they have about 256 seats in the lower house. So you see the margins is very small and they couldn't have done that. They couldn't have formed the government without um, um, the tilted electoral systems that allowed uh, 11 single seat parties to join force with them. You also um, talked about the opposition, which I think is was one of the main focuses of this uh, of this study, and I would like now to turn to to Tanzania and talk about the role and the state of opposition in Tanzania. Uh, I've read in the study that um, the state has been trying to oppress the opposition by uh, imposing a very long, um, very long uh, um, assembly uh, assembly time. They they would need to ask for permission uh, thirty days if I'm if I'm correct. Uh, Forty-eight hours. Forty-eight hours. I'm sorry, I, I must have <laughs> uh, misheard you this morning. Um, and that there is also there have often been cases where the state uh, shut the internet down and WhatsApp and SMS. I had uh, written down here uh, just to oppress and to make 
an assembly of an opposition party, a party rally, to make it more difficult or even to oppress it and make it impossible. How would you describe then, the state of the opposition in, in Tanzania? That's yeah, um, I think this goes back to the uh, background information that I gave. Um, now, um, having a legal framework that is um, tilted or skewed toward um, the ruling party, that does not give an opportunity for um, opposition parties to thrive institutionally. So I would say um, op uh, opposition political parties in Tanzania are institutionally weak in terms of organization, in terms of resources, both uh, personal and material resources. Um, Structure-wise, um, it's very rare to find um, a lot of uh, uh, opposition parties having structures from the national level to the grassroots levels. And many of these opposition parties, even the stronger ones, are mainly based in, um, um, in urban areas. And I would say that the institutional weaknesses of opposition parties is by design. It's not their own internal problems. It is because of the systemic problem itself, where the legal framework does not give um, equal opportunity to all the players. Right now, we have um, 19 registered political parties in Tanzania, but only three parties are represented in the parliament and in the local councils. And um, in fact, as we speak, um, um, the outcome of the last general elections in 2020 has actually uh, brought back Tanzania into the era of one party system whereby the parliament is 90% dominated by the ruling party. And I would say um, we have a one party dominant uh, system um, and the opposition party um, uh, does not, by and large, um, have um, an opportunity to grow and institutionalize and act as, I mean, uh, a credible threat to the establishment that we have in place. And what we say, why is it like, um, why isn't the opposition, or how is the opposition especially how is it made for the opposition that they cannot win elections and that they, what are the rules that are imposed upon them and what are the rules that um, make it easier for the government party to, to remain in power? Um, I'm, I, I'm not saying that opposition parties have not been winning elections. They have just not been able to, um, out, um, to oust the ruling party that has been in power since independence. Um, now, as I said, so the, the constitution that we have right now is spirited um, in, you know, to advance uh, the one-party system as opposed to the uh, plural uh, competitive politics. And there are several ways. So the constitution, much as it gives um, uh, uh, political parties to, you know, to, to be formed, to be registered, but um, there are regulations um, in the work of political parties. And I'll give you just a few examples. One, um, the, 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 the Political Parties Act that regulates political parties has a lot of uh, provisions that work um, against uh, opposition parties. For instance, we have a register of political parties. Who is a presidential appointee? And uh, this president may decide to remove this person from power or not. And the registrar of political parties are given immense powers to interfere into the political, um, internal political activities of parties. Okay. Um, uh, the, the, the Political Parties Act also gives provisions for uh, party funding. Okay. So parties may get uh, funding from government subsidies, from individual contributions, from foreign donors, but these must be disclosed. For example, as an individual, if you want to provide support to political parties, if that support exceeds one million Tanzanian shillings, which is about 400 US dollars, um, this needs to be disclosed to the Registrar of Political Parties. If you are a foreigner and you want to uh, contribute to political parties, 
If that contribution is above um, 800 US dollars, which is about 2 million to 9 shillings, that has to also be disclosed to the Registrar of Political Parties at least 30 days. What happens if you disclose it to them? Will they... Uh... I mean, the purpose of disclosing is, first of all, to know who contributes and uh, what amount of money is contributed. Because if parties receive support, that means they will do their work effectively. And if the system does not want parties to thrive, then they would want to know who contributes and what amount. And if it is, um, um, you know, like it's, it's a local contributor, um, you know, you would always uh, get into problems. Sometimes in Tanzania we say, um, uh, you, will, you will be safe if, you know, you are... Uh, probably seen as a supporter of, of, of the establishment rather than uh, the opposition. So that really brings a lot of um, uh, problems to the flourishment of uh, political parties and democracy in general. Um, another restriction is the um, uh, restriction to political uh, rallies and assemblies. Uh, much as the law allows parties to hold rallies, you, you would know that uh, for the past seven years there was a ban to political rallies and political activities. And this ban was just lifted this January by the, uh, the current president, uh, Samia Salu Hassan. Uh, but in order to do a political rally or assembly in Tanzania, you need to um, uh, inform the police officer in charge of the area where you want to hold a rally 48 hours before. Now, in so many instances um, throughout the multi-party uh, politics since 1992, uh, most of the opposition parties' uh, rallies have been stopped for reasons that probably these rallies will turn uh, chaotic. You know, the, the police will say we have intelligence raised, uh, you know, information that it will not be safe for you to do uh, the rise. But the aim has actually been to limit um, our party activities. Uh, turning back to donations, you said that there is this limit from where you have to publish the names of the people people that donate to your party. Are there any repercussions that the people that donate to parties, and I'm talking about foreigners and citizens, what are the repercussions that uh, they might expect if they donate, for example, for opposition parties? Um, well, I mean, so far I have not heard of any um, repercussions, but I think uh, having that kind of a provision would uh, would make people hesitant to, like, why would I be known uh, if, if I support party A or party B? So that kind of um, uh, censorship may not attract many people to probably... Uh, directly support uh, political parties and probably if support is, is, is given direct to parties this might, might be quite in, in informally because people wouldn't want to be um, seen as supporting uh, the opposition and, and this also applies to the locals. And t turning around and talking about Thailand, also about the opposition and party financing and how the situation, the rules are made harder to uh, be fulfilled by the oppositions. Is it similar as in Tanzania, or would you say it's better or it's worse? I think it's better. Um, comparing to Tanzania, I think two things that be Thailand and Tanzania are basically different is that uh, Tanzania seems to be a one dominant party, whereas Thailand is a, a fragment tensions of party system. Uh, there are 24 parties elected in the lower house. There are about uh, more than 80 parties registered with election commission. And in terms of uh, political environment, um, the ruling uh, parties and the opposition parties alike can operate um, in the open air. Um, one thing about um, the opposition party that has to be very cautious is that the tendency that they can be dissolved is huge, which is um, unpredictable. But otherwise, other than that, um, uh, opposition parties in Thailand can operate freely. For example, uh, financing, um, um, 
the law allowed the taxpayer to donate 500 baht or about um, 12 euro to any parties from our tax refund. And um, currently, the move forward, which is the second largest opposition party, received the biggest amount from, from the public. Um, the laws uh, stipulate that um, anyone can donate to the parties, and yes, uh, basically anyone. Um, the limitation is that if the donation is more than one million baht, you have to disclose uh, the amount and uh, where the money comes from. And uh, the ceiling for donation is 10 million baht, or about uh, 25 euro. And the parties can also have like organized fundraising events, and all the parties, uh, the government and opposition parties alike, will do that. Just last week, uh, Palang Pasharat, the government party, the biggest government party, uh, organized um, um, a, like a Chinese like dinner, and they sold um, one table with ten people for three million baht, which is about um, 100 euro. And they received the fundings for more than 500 million baht. And uh, I believe in the course uh, into the next election, every party will have that fundraising event. So I would say uh, Thai parties operate in a more free environment. But the biggest threat is that their chance to be dissolved can happen anytime, and especially if the next election, I, I speculate that um, the opposition camp will gain more seats in the lower house, bigger than uh, the coalition government. And if the coalition government want to form um, a government, they need the support from the senators, which they appoint those 250 senators themselves. But then again, if uh, the opposition party gain more seats in the lower house, um, the ruling party right now will become the minority party, right? The technique that they can do is dissolve some of the opposition parties. Once the party is dissolved, uh, the MPs are free to join with any other parties, and that's the way they do it. Like last time, um, the future forward was dissolved, and some of the party members who were elected to join force with uh, the ruling parties like that. Zirupan, you were talking about uh, the fact that in Thailand it is very easy to dissolve parties. Can you maybe elaborate a bit on the legal framework of party dissolution? Why can a party be dissolved, and who can decide upon that? Well, the first time that um, the party was dissolved was in 2006, after the coup d'etat. Um, the constituents said that um, the organization that has this power to dissolve the parties is the constitutional court upon the request from the election commission. And there are several reasons that parties can be dissolved, for example, they did not follow the rules required by the Party Act. For example, they need to have uh, 5,000 members from the beginning and 50,000 members across the country in the course of four years with four branches. If they fail to do that, the Election Commission can ask the Constitutional Court to dissolve the party. So like that, this is more like uh, technical problems from the parties. And uh, the other way is if the parties found guilty of something, for example, after the 2019 general elections, uh, the Future Forward, which is uh, the second largest opposition in Thailand back then, was dissolved because um, it said that the Constitu Constitutional Court said that uh, the party violated uh, the party's law. The party loaned the money from its own party leader. And uh, according to the law, like I said before, um, the donation to the party cannot exceed 10 million baht, 10 million Thai baht. 
but that loan is exceeding 10 million baht. So that's used as the reason uh, to dissolve the party. Uh, this is against uh, many public's opinion, but it's done. So you see that um, any tiny reasons can be used as an excuse to s dissolve the party. Vote buying is another reason. If um, executive members of the parties is found guilty of vote buying, the whole party will be dissolved. And this has been done to um, uh, tyrannize uh, sister party Palang Pasharat. I'm sorry, tyrannize sister party Palang Pasharat, the People's Action Party, uh, back in uh, 2007. So um, in the course of about 20 years, there have been more than 20 parties dissolved by uh, the Constitutional Court upon the request of the Election Commission. And uh, talking about the Constitutional Court, I also want to talk to you about the judiciary and the trust in the constitutional state. How would you say is the state of the rule of law in, in Thailand? How impartial are the courts? Not especially the Constitutional Court, mm -hmm. but the courts in general. What is the power of the judiciary? Well, the power of the judiciary the power of the judiciary in Thailand is very high. Um, maybe because it's conducted uh, in the name of the king. Uh, as for the constitutional court itself, um, the nine judges were appointed mainly from the junta government, from the MCPO. So uh, they were a lot of criticisms against uh, the constitutional court verdict many times, uh, but the power of the constitutional court is is very, very high, and it's, it seemed to be expanded for the past many years, uh, up to the point that some people call it um, uh, the judi judicialization. Uh, they use the power to like dissolve the party, uh, to strike down some of uh, the legislative um, law, for example, um, abortion rights or same-sex marriage. And uh, recently they just had a verdict on the term limit of the prime minister. So um, I believe that uh, the constitutional court has, uh, has played a very big role in every turning point of Thai politics. How would you say that? How consistent are their decisions? Do you, do you have? I, I to my understanding, that also there's also been courts that do not publish any reasoning to their decisions. Um, how is this in Thailand? Do you do you have a sort of legal reasoning and the decisions that the courts render, and are they consistent with the the previous um, the previous judicial practice of Thai of Thailand? Well, they have to publish the reasons. But um, there, there's no requirement uh, from the reason for individual judges. They come out as uh, like overall uh, reasonings. Um, as for the consistency, I would say, well, not 100% consistency. Uh, the verdict seem to be more kind of pro-conservative ideology. And um, sometimes it's, uh, I mean, the criticisms against the constitutional court verdict is, uh, is prohibited. And um, when there is... What do you mean by prohibited? Would it be illegal to publish uh, an academic article criticizing the decision of the constitutional court? Well, there are some incidents that people were charged from criticizing the court, even some academic... Uh, was charged for criticizing the verdict like that. So it's not, I mean, written in the law, but the constitutional court would say that uh, this is contempt of the court. So this is kind of uh, a threatening recommendation from the court itself. Understood. And the same thing also about uh, Tanzania. Consulata, how would you say how independent is the judiciary in Tanzania? Um, because of the, 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 the upper hand, uh, the executive branch, especially the president, um, have in the, in, the, in the judiciary, then uh, we, 
we can conclude that the independence of the judiciary is not is not guaranteed. Um, so um, that, that, that's what I would uh, I would say. And uh, also talking about the legal reasoning of the courts, do the does the court have to publish any reasoning when they yeah. render? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, they they, they do publish. And are they consistent them. with their previous jurisprudence? No, um, sometimes they are not. And I will give an example of one uh, very popular case on independent candidates in Tanzania, which is uh, constitutionally. Um, not allowed. So if um, you want to compete for electoral positions in Tanzania, one must be um, a member of a political party. But at, this, at the same time, the constitution gives um, freedom uh, to individuals to associate. So uh, this particular uh, provision on uh, people being members of parties to compete for electoral positions was questioned um, in the court of law. And um, in the first instance, the court decided uh, in favor of independent candidacy and recommended the government to actually allow independent candidacy. That was in 2006. But then the government um, appealed to the, the, to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal um, actually uh, ruled in favor of government, and they said uh, this is a political thing, <laughs> and then, and therefore, it has to be uh, solved politically. So you can see the inconsistency, um, and that I would say is because of the um, um, of the upper hand that the executive has over other um, organs of government. Thank you. And to, to wrap up our conversation today, I'd also like to give our listeners an outlook uh, on the um, legal system and on the political system of Thailand and Tanzania. And I'd like to ask you, what do you think like, the biggest challenge in the democratization process is? And uh, Sirapani, if you'd like to start. Well, I think the biggest challenge is, uh, there are three biggest challenges. Uh, first of all, um, the possibility of coup d'etats in Thailand mm -hmm. can happen. I think this is like a, a basic ABC thing. Um, the second one is... Um, um, the establishment in Thailand, the conservative clique, uh, seem to unaware of the changing landscape of uh, of the waters itself. Um, the younger generation seems to um, ask for demand that they think uh, they should have, but the establishment seem to uh, unaware of this change and. Um, uh, the conflict between, um, I'm not saying only the younger and older generation, but the pro-progressive camp or pro-democratic camp, as they call themselves, and a uh, 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 nationalist or royalist camp is uh, in going to be more intensified maybe after the next election. Uh, the third one uh, regarding the political parties itself. The parties in Thailand um, have been created to serve as an instrument for particular uh, ambitious leaders, be it uh, politicians or retired military, both alike. They tend to be personalized. So uh, you name it, Thai parties today, if, um, I mean, it seems that each party has its own owners, its own leader, either behind the scene or playing uh, up front. So if these party leaders are gone, the party might not exist anymore. So the biggest problem in Thailand is that we don't have um, an institution that keep the linkage between um, electoral politics and the voters. Uh, factionalized parties, um, switching parties uh, are common. So these are three biggest challenges for Thailand democratization.
And Consulata, what do you say? What is the biggest challenge for Tanzania? Um, just pick two main ones. One is on the legal institutional framework, which is too highly skewed towards the ruling party and does not uh, provide for equal opportunities for all the players. And, and in this case, um, for uh, especially for the opposition parties. And therefore, the legal system um, is, is so much uh, restrictive um, that political uh, opposition does not have a chance um, uh, to actually threaten the dominance of, the, of, of political parties. And therefore, I think we need um, um, a lot uh, to do in terms of legal reforms. But the second one, I think, is in, on the part of the Tanzanians themselves. I think um, Tanzanians have been characterized um, as um, subject. <laughs> Um, so we need, um, because even when uh, we want to, to, to make changes, if we don't have a critical mass to influence and pressure for changes and reform, I think we will still uh, be having uh, problems in terms of uh, the future of, of democracy in the country. Consulata, Siripan, thank you for joining me today and sharing all these very thoughtful insights about the legal and political system in your countries. I think I learned a lot and I hope that our listeners uh, have as well. Uh, I would like to point out to our listeners that the study is called Strengthening Legal Frameworks for Political Parties and it will be available at the link that we will reference in the show notes. Also, I would like to invite all our listeners to follow the work of the Düsseldorf Party Research Institute and the work of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Brussels, but also in general. You will find links to all our social media platforms in the show notes as well. We thank you for joining us today and wish you a good stay here in Brussels. Thank you. <laughs>